Uh, my name is Sheila Pantin. I, when I was serving uh, with the army during the war, my maiden name was Hull. I was living at Immingham, which is in North Lincolnshire at the time, but uh, I, uh, we moved there from Yorkshire. I'm Yorkshire born and bred. Uh, where did you live during the war? Oh, uh, well, when the war broke out, I was living in Immingham at home with my family and went to school in Cleethorpes. And, um, uh, Travelling daily, of course, not not a residential, and um, then I stayed there till till so I took my school certificate as they were then, and higher school certificate, and then I was seventeen and a half, and um, I want because of circumstances at home, I I wanted to join the forces. Now, my father had been in the Royal Naval Air Service during the First World War, and when the RAF was formed in 1918, he transferred from there into the RAF. And my brother uh, was um, made a career, whole, his whole uh, uh, career was in the Air Force. He was in the Air Force, um, the Royal Air Force. He was older than me, and is, now he has died, unfortunately. But um, the, uh, so they were very disappointed when Father got the brown envelope one day and he said, what's all this then? And so I said, what is that? I've forgotten what I'd, I'd done. And he said, um, you, you, don't, you can't join, you know, till you're 18. So I so, said, so I should go then. Because they were disappointed. I, they wanted me to join the, uh, the Air Force. And I said, uh, uh, I shall go when I'm 18 then. So he gave in and signed it, so I went before I was 18, yes, yes. When war broke out, well, like, how did you feel when you first heard of it? Well, I remember being at church on the, uh, on the particular Sunday morning, it was a Sunday, when the, and uh, the preacher, church started at half past ten, that's right, we were sort of halfway through, and then somebody came from the back and went, up to the preacher in, in the pulpit and handed this paper to him and he said, oh, I'm very sorry to say that we are now at war with Germany. Mr Chamberlain has just announced it on the radio and kind of thing. So I said, so, he says, I think we'd better all go home. So we didn't have the sermon, no. <laughs> you see, we all got up and went home and some people were crying and some people were cheering and that kind of thing. We all went home and that was the start of the war. And... Um, the following day, of course, we were at school on the Monday, so off I went on the school bus kind of thing, and we were horrified. When I only went to girls' schools. I never went to a mixed school in my in, in my army in my uh, in, in my childhood with schools and things. And uh, it was a, late, a girls' school at Cleethorpes, and the headmistress and all the staff came onto the platform as usual, and there we all were standing. We didn't uh, sit for. Uh, uh, prayers, what do you call it, anyway, whatever, whatever it was, and uh, uh, we looked and there was one of the staff missing, the teacher who taught us German, Miss Inge, remember, she was a lovely, lovely person kind of thing, she wasn't there, and so Miss uh, Fisher, who's our headmistress, Daffodil Marguerite Fisher, she was, <laughs> you couldn't imagine anyone less like her, she was about this wide, about this high, less like her, uh, uh, Daffodil or Marguerite, and she said, um, uh, very sad to say that Miss Inge will not be joining us anymore. She'd actually been interned and she stayed interned, because she was a German born, but she, you know, she taught us German and that kind of thing, which was all very sad and people were very sad about it indeed. So we never had any German all the war, yeah, as it was. And uh, so we started doing things towards war and things like that, yes. Did any of your family members fight in the war? Yes, my brother was in the RAF. Uh, he was in the RAF in 1936 and just finished training. Uh, uh, well, it was due to finish at the Christmas, uh, uh, 30, uh, 39, but they decided to qualify them all. And uh, next thing we knew, he was in France. He was um, uh, one of the few squadrons of the RAF who went to France and he got home, we were very good to say, at Dunkirk. He was one of the many uh, thousands, you know, that didn't make it, but some, a lot did, and we thank God that he did. It was an awful time for him. 
What role did you have in the war? Uh, well, I was a lance corporal to begin with in uh, <laughs> one stripe uh, when I stayed at Pontefract because, uh, quite frankly, the, it was at a time when uh, women were being conscripted into the first, uh, being conscripted into the forces. And finally, the powers that be uh, sent for me and said, right, you're posted, uh, sent off, to London, to the what we call the war office, or the, uh, you know, big, big noises in London. I'd never been, well, I had been to London because I had cousins in London, but I didn't rem remember it very much. So uh, uh, off I went on the train with full kiss and everything like that, and down to um, uh, London, and I met, we were, billeted in a beautiful house in the West End of, of London that had been vacated by people who had gone uh, to live safely in, in land or in foreign parts. And, uh, and there were about 30 of us, I believe, who would come from all different uh, parts of the British Isles. And we were called what was called the Special Platoon, the ATS Special Platoon. And our job was to travel all around the British Isles. We didn't go over to Northern Ireland, no. Uh, Scotland, Wales and England. We uh, um, uh, go around there, take them around there. And we did sort of uh, th things to show that what we were doing, the ATS were doing during the war. Because at the time, we, the ATS, the the public and everything were all told that these ATS ladies were, uh, were just there for the convenience of the men and the thing. And uh, so we were showing them and we went and we stayed. They put us in private uh, accommodation, in, in two or three of us at a time, staying with ladies in the town, wherever we were, kind of way, and uh, uh, who looked after us whilst we were there. And uh, then we made our way, uh, or oh, they picked us up or something, to go into the, the, the Market Square or whatever it was in the town we were in, but uh, sadly it had to all come to an end, and uh, we were um, not. Um, we were all interviewed and said, "Now, what do you want to do now?" Uh, I was still a lance corporal, by the way. <laughs> there was one sergeant and two cor full corporals, and two or three of us lance corporals, and. Um, so I said, she said, do you, do you drive? I said, yes, I can drive. Oh, I said, would you like to drive then? There's ambulance driving, you know, staff car driving. I said, that sounds super to me. So they said, right, there's two training centres, uh, Camberley, near London, and Edinburgh. So I said, is there anything in Edinburgh itself? So they said, yes, yes. We've got a, 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 the castle, the castle. Uh, which she might have not been to, but that was an ambulance um, a hospital during the war, you see, and they, so they have their own ambulances there. Uh, so I said, yes, that sounds fine with me. So I lived in a flat near the castle with another girl, and there were a lot of us about the, uh, in different parts of Edinburgh. I was posted, unfortunately, I had to leave them, which was very, very sad. I, I didn't, uh, didn't want to leave at all, down to Windsor to the barracks where the horse guards anyway, I, uh, I was down there uh, to be a sergeant. And then one day they sent for me and they said uh, to the officers, uh, we've got to ask you, and there were civilian men there, uh, all English, of course, kind of thing, and talking to me. And they said, we wondered if you would go and work in the camps. So I said, well, uh, yes. You see, we we'd no idea about these concentration camps. You think we were never told about it or anything like that. And I thought they meant army camps. You see, we were going to set up PT uh, uh, for the, the troops that were going to stay as the British Army of the Rhine, you see. And so, so I said, oh, I don't mind. Yes, yes, I'll go there. And I found that it was that uh, it was a concentration camp I was going to. And uh, it billeted in a German hotel, uh, which were, were very friendly, they were very friendly and um, looked after me and I got to this, uh, the camp and I saw awful, awful, awful things that there were. And uh, uh, just, okay, and CEO came to me and they said, right, so we hadn't had anybody before, a, a woman, because uh, of course I'd just got my army uh, uh, kit to, to wear, and they said, we haven't had women, but will you look after the women? Were there anything from women in the 60s, 70s and something like that down to children who were born in the camp or 
you know, were eight or nine and uh, had, had gone with the parents into the camp or otherwise. And uh, so I just took, oh, it was dreadful. It was dreadful. They were almost like animals. They weren't Jewish necessarily. They were gypsies and, and, and they weren't necessarily German. They were all different from different countries round about that had been uh, dragged into these concentration camps. And I thought this was it. But there were all these others, you see, as well. Everywhere there were these concentration camps. And, and I faced with that, and they didn't know what to say it was to do. So I said, first of all, I went to see the end. I said, first of all, uh, I, I want to make them uh, uh, human again, because they were almost like animals. You know, you know, if they got any food, they were stuffing it into the faces. Because by the time I, I got there, they were being fed, you know, the, the army rations and things like that kind of thing. And uh, they were getting used to food, but it was so tragic. Oh, this book. And they had no clothes, no underclothes, and things like that. So I said, first of all, we're going to make them human. I said, as soon as you can, lorries full of underclothes, bras and pants and, and things like that. And I said, and what, I, what we'll do, I'll uh, occupy them by making uh, clothes. So one day, then it soon came kind of thing, and I got them all bathed and deep, because most of them riddled with um, TB, you know, because they, of uh, all they'd gone and they hadn't been fed and things like that. So um, they had uh, thin, and that was started to get fat, fat I believe you me. And um, so the bales of cloth came like this, every different colour and size. I don't know what kind of cloth it was. So all I did was roll out these long rolls of, 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 of all different colours kind of thing. And I laid, first of all, the children down on them and drew round them. <laughs> it made me some sort of smock of them and did the same for the ladies later on. But I thought I wanted, I wanted to get the children covered up and it, it made human kind of thing. And then I got thousands of bobbins of uh, cotton and needles and scissors and cutting out scissors. I must have some decent scissors to cut out these things. And uh, so um, uh, we did this and then I told because they didn't they'd never seen a needle. They didn't know how to sew or anything like that. So how to thread in the needles and everything. And then uh, just back stitching all around the arms, you know, like that. Just making a small and round the neckline and on the, down to the bottom. And uh, they, very slow, very slow, believe you me. No machines or anything like that. And eventually I got the children, the women made them for the children, you see. And then we got them making them for themselves and so on. And uh, it, they, that was a very interesting, and by this time, you see, I was like, these were from Poland, these were from Latvia, they were this and that and the other, all, all over the place kind of thing. And I didn't know how to start speaking to them or anything, so um, I, I taught them little songs and uh, hymns mainly, because I'd always been a Christian, and, uh, they sang, and, and then they sang their own little songs from the different countries and that, which was lovely. And of course, by the time I left in the march, I was sent for one day and said, next Wednesday you will be on the troop train back to Calais and over back, because you've been demobbed in York. And, uh, oh, that's so terrible this time because uh, you know I could say you know one or two bits of the languages a lot of, a lot of the languages were interchangeable in a way kind of thing mainly with the back, German background and I had no German at all and um, uh, so we uh, they were told uh, what, what they called me I forget what they called me they didn't call me sergeant or anything I forget what it was that they called me but they were told that I was going to be leaving next Tuesday night, you know, it, it kind of thing. Oh dear, that was terrible, terrible. So they came on the uh, Sunday or whatever it was, only uh, men came and they said, they want to give a party for you on the Tuesday night before you go, kind of thing. I thought, oh God, we have a party. <laughs> and watched it. Anyway, uh, uh, it came to it. So I went back to, and I didn't have any civilian clothes to wear, kind of thing, but uh, I tidied myself up as best as I could, kind of thing, and went back to there. And they were in this hut, which was 
you know, about the, half the size of this. And in the middle was a table and all the chairs around the outside and they were all sitting there when I came in and all cheered and, 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 and so we sat down and, and I thought, uh, you know, he, he thought it might have been a buffet or something like that. So the door opened and this big uh, uh, army uh, chef came in with this great cauldron. Ooh, like that. That. Uh, and that. And uh, some others came in with the uh, uh, sticks of, uh, of bread, you know, uh, uh, what do we call them? Uh, baguettes. Baguettes, that's right, which were torn up in there. And that was it. And when they take the li lid off, it was bush. And they just remembered the, uh, uh, how to make it, and these girls, and uh, told the uh, sergeant that. And I've loved it ever since. It's it made with beetroot and that kind of thing. And they sort of labelled it out with all a bowl of this kind of thing. And oh, it was lovely, lovely. They gave me, I think they managed to give me some presents. I can't remember what, what it was, because it was something handmade, because they had no shops or anything like that. But that was very sad, and we were all crying and we trying to sing the songs we'd learnt and had learnt songs we'd learnt and that. Very, very, very sad indeed. How did you cope with the sights you saw at Belson? Well, you had to. I don't suppose I slept much at night. I had a very comfortable bed in this comfortable, very comfortable hotel I was living in. They did all my washing and that.